Welcome to Sonic Talk number 362. If you were around last week for the live show, I'm terribly sorry I was at a wedding. In fact, I was having lunch at, apparently, one of the top five restaurants in the country, at the uh, Manoir Quatre Saison, with, which is uh, Raymond Blanc, which was very nice indeed. Congratulations to our friends... Uh, Catherine and Mark, where they got married. Anyway, uh, but I hope you enjoyed the um, interview with... Axel Hartman, who was uh, very kindly came on and talked about his design philosophy and all that kind of stuff. So um, we're back this week. We are live. Uh, if you wanted to know what that's all about, we've got a live chat room, uh, which I will now show here. Live chat room. Uh, if I, yeah, you can see me and it. I probably need to wiggle my... Yeah, if I move my camera a little bit, then I'll be in shot and... Yeah, there we go. You know what I'm saying. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I've got, obviously, um, Isotope are our sponsors, and we have the winner of a competition two weeks ago, so I didn't set a competition this winner this week, but you will also get the chance to win Isotope Iris again, and you might find that you've won this week. Well, you probably won't win twice, because that would probably... We should probably put something in rules about that. Anyway, I'm rambling. It's probably time for my guests to see me straight. So I'll go over first to Mr. Robbie Bronneman over there in Robot Studios. Robbie is, of course, uh, musical director. Well, probably more music MD for Howard Jones at the moment because he's about to head off on tour and has been putting the rig together. And hopefully we'll have a little look at that later. He sent a video, so I'm really looking forward to showing that. Robbie, how are you? Very good, thanks. Yeah, I'm just um, glad that all the all the cases and all that stuff's out of the way because I've been just up to my eyes and dimensions and all that kind of business for the last two weeks. So it's been very boring. Oh, what a nightmare. Yeah. Well, not a nightmare. It is a nightmare, but yeah. it's like planning a patch bay, but ultimately yeah. satisfying because yeah. you're going to get to use it. It's got to be right, okay? Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we're going gonna... gonna... gonna to see a Go little on. bit of that later as well, I hope. So cool. I'm quite excited by that. And cool. also, we're uh, coming in reverse order, just four from four down to one rich you are in position three this week rich hilton of course chic keyboardist and uh, nile rogers personal studio guy um very very busy still i'm sure how are you very well thank you i see you're going to be playing in ibiza i yes, saw i just saw something week. come up next week wow next rocking. week yeah yeah but first we go to paris this weekend ah where do you play in paris at a festival in called Montero. Ah. Mon it's about an hour outside of Paris, actually. It's not Montreux as in the deep as the in classic Switzerland. Deep no. No. And no, and forgive my <laughs> sketchy interpretation of the French language. Well, that's all right. I hope you have a lovely time. Does that mean you won't be with us next week? Or you um it's let me think. I think I'm traveling, what, the 11th? Um, I'm not looking at a calendar. Oh, it doesn't um, matter. Doesn't matter. I, I, want to put I you have on the to spot. check my flight time. Okay. It, it, Wednesday is the day I'll be leaving. Ah, okay. Well, maybe not. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, like I say there, I'm your, as the notice in the, in the chat room, that uh, they spotted your uh, subtle product placement of Electron. Today is a bit of an Electron uh, day because, of course, we posted the uh, history of Electron that we shot with Jenk, a.k.a. Dataline, if you want to have a look at some SID station right up through to Analog Rhythm with all the stuff in between, then do check it out. I posted it live on the site. seems to be doing very well. And, uh, and uh, Rich, you're, you're flying the flag for Electron, too. They do make quality garments. I'm very pleased with the shirt, and uh, they're very nice people. <laughs> I've never been able to afford an Electron T-shirt. They are just, I, I, yeah. Anyway, I won't go into it, but they are they are pricey garments, but quality. So let's come coming back through. We've got number two, Mark Tinley. Um, you're a little bit low in your frame. Perhaps you could just tilt yourself somehow so that we can see. You've gone a bit pixely as well, but I'm guessing that's your bandwidth. Hopefully, it won't affect your audio. Mark Tinley, of course, creative thinker, uh, sound artist, and uh, kitchen broadcaster. How are you, Mark <laughs> Tinley? <laughs> How is that? Do I look all right now? You look you look fine if a little Front pixelated, but we'll just have to work with it. Anyway, how are you, Mark? You well? I'm all right. Yeah, I don't know why I'm pixelated. I don't think we're doing anything It's just dramatic. A, we occasionally... We, we, my sons play Minecraft. We occasionally have a bad Skype day, don't we? It's just the way it goes. So, uh, But anyway, thank you for Oh, joining. how am I? Oh, yeah. yeah, how am I? I'm all right. <laughs> Good. I'm glad to hear that, too. 
Uh, and well, I'm coming straight back here to uh, Mr. Gaswald Williams uh, of uh, Bristol bass playing, music production, mastering, kind of all about music technologist kind of guy. How are you, Mr. Gaz? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. Uh, I played a gig at the weekend with the classic dance band The Egg. Ah, yes, I remember uh, them. Which who play live dance, sort of like a kind of trancey sort of techno, but it's like a proper band. So it's really quite interesting to do. But uh, I have to say, I think I did one of the naughtiest things possibly in the history of music technology. I played, because I was playing my MIDI bass, I played MIDI bagpipes. Oh. I smuggled them into the set. I thought it would just... Uh, heretic. <laughs> Good work. I managed to get this drone thing going on, and I was controlling it with with like the expression pedal but i was just bringing in this big midi bagpipe so i thought that was a crime deviant. against all music <laughs> well the, the egg are a very if you haven't seen them the egg are a very kind of musically um uh high jinx kind of act aren't they? they they kind of like to throw things in there to to uh keep us on our, our toes i remember seeing them but that is that they run the clock off the drummer don't they they take the bass drum and it, it runs the clock for everything else in the show am i right in thinking yeah, that's what they do normally. Sadly, Maff wasn't there on that gig. He was in Turkey, so there was a, a, a Deppin drummer, a guy called Tony. But um, ordinarily, that's what they do. Uh, and it's really clever because I've played with them a few times and using various MIDI devices. And it takes its yeah. And I take my clock from Maff, who's um, yeah. I, I'm, I can't remember the name of the software he's using, but uh, yeah, he's constantly giving MIDI trigger, and so everything follows his tempo. He can speed up and slow down, so it's all. Um, yeah, it's all. He could it, it makes it, it makes it organic, and it also makes the arrangements completely on the fly as well, which yeah. is quite nice, given that it the, the, the techno sound of it sounds like a lot of fun. Certainly mm. does. Um, sadly, not a lot of fun is not perhaps our first topic this week, but uh, we feel it only proper to uh, to kind of discuss uh, Steve Howell's uh, great works. Obviously, Steve Howell is, uh, you know, has had a major impact in music technology over the years. You know, Akai Samples, Hollow Sun, all of that. I was sadly taken sort of ill suddenly last weekend and um, passed away very, very quickly, which is a big shock to everybody. Um, he's a, an amazing guy, though. I mean, we've, we've talked about Hollow Sun products in the past. We've had, you know, some really good... He's like the king of sampling in terms of looping and what have you. It's just a really interesting bloke. And we never got the opportunity to have him on the show, and I, I, I really do regret that. Now, I know you guys were uh, quite a close friend of his, so, I mean, it must, be, uh, it must be tough times for you, but, you know, also perhaps some good memories would be uh, appropriate at this time so we can kind of send him off with a, with a kind of... Uh, <laughs> A, a sense of you know the stuff that he achieved right yeah i mean it it, it was a complete shock um rob uh Perichelli failed sent music, a message yeah. on on thursday i think it was to say that he'd been taken ill and uh sadly by the saturday he'd passed away from uh, i'm not sure what it was but an illness of some form uh and it was complete for me it was completely out of the blue i was with him fairly recently um uh so it, i it, horrible what what a sh what a shock you know um he was such a character as well i mean for anyone who knew him he you know he's such a quirky character such a quirky character he would always be wearing you know tweed and brogues he always looked really he sort of dapper, had a very dapper yeah. yeah like a kind of sort of yeah yeah dapper gent um it's a great look his, in anybody i feel yeah and his uh his flat his apartment was really nice as well it was it looked it it, it sort of had the same kind of um stylistic maybe like 1930s kind of look about it all and he had this big table in the middle which he had his computers on and he also had his um dot com modular as well off Ooh, the side nice but it was it just looked so wonderful and so stylish the way it all was in his uh in his you know, in his room there, and um, he 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 had a very funny outlook on the world as well. You know, a very dry sense of humour. Uh, uh, it's ah, he. It's. I mean, it's such a. It was such a shock. Um, we just started working on a project together as well. So sadly, that'll that won't see the light of day. Um, 
Well, I, don't I know mean, what else. I think one of the things that you know we we should probably remember is you know for those of us who came up through the world of Akai, you know Akai samplers, whatever, he was responsible for a lot of the early sample libraries that kind of travelled with us through yeah. from uh, S nine hundred right up through to you know to, to later days when they probably ended up in ESX twenty four or whatever it is. I've still got a whole bunch of samples that I've you know fr- that have come with me, big boxes of floppies that I've sort of ingested into my overall sample library, mm-hmm. and I'm sure he's kind of responsible for a lot of those. It also had yes. a lot to do with the GUI for the S1000, S5000, 6000, and Axis software. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but programming, certainly programming uh, Akai samplers for live, that was absolutely invaluable uh, to, to kind of set up very quick. Um, and r- rather than be sitting there poking away at things, you can do it remotely via, um, I think it was you, you need a USB board from what I remember for the uh, Akais and it, uh, the, the later Akais, the six, the five and the 6000. Um, and it did a lot of um, basically, you know, great stuff. That and also, I don't know if you remember the Akai um, hard disk recorders. I don't know if anybody ever used any of those. They were kind of, well, I think we yeah. used them live for Golfrap for a while. Then, and, and he had a lot to do with making those. Uh, you know, uh, did a whole bunch of things in terms of um, just. Well, the last the last time I was with him, actually, I was telling him that I that I that I'd been looking for a Akai DPS twenty four, which is the large uh all in one hard disk recorder but with a control surface and he's his eyes totally lit up when i mentioned that because i think that was one of the last projects that he'd worked on with akai um and he he was integral in the design of that you know uh, the the layout and the, the controls uh and he you know so when i told him that i was kind of seeking one of them out which i still am if if anyone's got one but um he was you know, he 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 just his his whole face lit up about that, and um, I think it's a, you know, I th- I think it's so interesting that he'd been involved in well, he because he was originally involved in making sample libraries, and then got drawn in and and started getting involved in the the ah, okay. um in in into the hardware side of things. But um, there was a little coincidence on Saturday because I told I was playing as I mentioned earlier with the egg, and I mentioned um about steve's untimely demise and um and as we were getting ready uh the guitarist pulled out he'd only brought one effect with him to use and it was a, an akai headrush delay pedal oh. and steve had, steve had told me about that um because that when that pedal came out and i think there's been two versions of it but um with the version one he uh just i'm not sure to do with whatever they'd built it with, he'd realized that there was enough um, memory inside it to, to, to turn it into a, a a looper, put a looper function into it as well, which, um, I, and I'm not sure if at that point it had been a combined delay pedal with a looper function, but it was certainly one of the first. Uh, and so that looper was there at Steve's, you know, Steve's idea to put that looper there. I think initially it was met with a bit of reticence from the from some of the others right. in the company. But uh, Adventure, that's gone on to- a bit of adventurous coding. That's awesome. Mm, Absolutely so awesome. Yeah. Um, Rich, I know that you. Um, I know that you were a big fan of some of the Hollow Sun libraries as well, because I mean, we we talked about them here on the show, haven't we? Uh, have you actually had any dealings? Did you meet the man in person? No, I never met him in person. But uh, in our online interactions, he was always really nice and uh, kind. And my heart goes out to his family. Um, you know, all the usual uh, mortality things come up for me about how it's all precious and we have to embrace every moment, and uh, you never know. Absolutely, yeah. That's th- those are wise words indeed. Uh, I mean, I guess Mark um, also from you know you must have been a big Akai user. So I mean, a lot of him was in the stuff that we've used that for years and years, really. Me? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I I grew up with S nine. Well, S. 612, S700, S900, S1000, all of them. <laughs> Without them, I wouldn't have a career, I don't think. So, I mean, they're like massively important because it, it made the whole thing affordable. Yeah. It made, um, I mean, one way I'd made it affordable before was to build something out of a ZX Spectrum. Um, and it had like four seconds of sample memory. And it was kind of usable, but really unusable in terms of it wasn't polyphonic or anything. So, suddenly having polyphony and access to like several seconds of sample sound yeah. and being able to do all that was like quite unbelievable and those sounds as well i mean 
Oh, well, the S nine hundred had one of the best libraries ever, I think. And the way the the way the S nine hundred sounded was because it had that compounding thing in it that worked a bit like DBX. Um, it meant you could get like stacks of sounds in an S nine hundred. None of the other samplers kind of worked quite like that. So no, you could get so uh, many ninety nine samples. Wasn't I, it? I, I never met that man though, but I do know the name. I mean, the name's sort of it's like you know he's one of the sort of folklores of our of our particular. Uh, kind of, you know what we do, isn't he? Absolutely. It's, that name's been around forever. So absolutely, it's a bit. It is a bit of a shock because it's sort of. I don't know. It makes you think about your own. Like it makes me realise I'm 51, and most of the time I haven't noticed that I'm any older than five. <laughs> uh, so <it's> like, <laughs> oh, I know this is a robot. Uh, yeah, yeah no, I, I mean, these things always do tend to make one reflect. I, uh, Robbie, um, yeah. got much Akai um, heritage in your oh, past? Oh. No, to be honest with you, my first sample was a Roland S770. Ah, yes. I, I just, I just went straight for that. Um, I just went straight for that route because I just thought at the time they were more musical because of the filter on them and everything. Yeah. And um, so I went the whole route with that. I had an S770 and the the SP700 playback version, um, and that's kind of my my history with sampling really before I got into computers. So, but I mean, the Hollow Sun libraries. I mean. For years, we've been using the the definitive CP70 library that Hollow Sun did with Howard for live to do No One Is to Blame and stuff like that. And um and more recently, I I've, I've loved the music laboratory machine stuff. So um you know yeah, it's a real tragedy. Someone so talented is gone. Absolutely, I uh, we did see Atomic Shadow in the chat room. I think there as well, who uh, is one of the guys who uh, you know Steve Howells has. Uh, mentored and brought you know, a lot of his sounds in, which we've talked about as well. Um, in fact, um, Rob Puricelli, uh, Fail Muso, has actually uh, created a uh, book of condolences uh, on failedmuso.com. Um, if you want to um, contribute to that, there's a lot of you know, some resources. There's some video of Steve. So if you if you have never seen him in person, you can get a sense of the man. And lots and lots of comments. And I think the one thing is, is you know, his family, uh, as Rob said, have, have been kind of really sort of been given some comfort in the fact that all of, all how many people were sort of touched by him and stuff so i don't want to dwell on it too much but you know rest in peace and um enjoy enjoy your spiritual life from now on and uh, you know i think that's kind of it's great that um he contributed so much to our community and, and obviously very very sad news so um let's move on a little bit i'm not sure if this is anything much more um uh, cheery but um a, a lot less a lot more trivial, I suppose, in many ways. Uh, but uh, only to some. I know, uh, Rich, this was something that was uh, you were very keen to talk about. And this is the news about um, the new Mac Pros uh, are not compatible with certain of the Universal Audio cards. Uh, I've spoken to Universal Audio as well. But uh, what? just, just out there, what's the issue um, that you came up against? Well, there's a hardware incompatibility between the new Mac Pro and running their most of their former card line in an uh, expansion chassis. Yeah. And my problem with that is this, that they haven't gotten it together to offer a reasonable upgrade path for their customers. And some of these products that don't run on the new computer were sold new as recently as a year ago. Um, yeah. And so... It's not so much that I think that they've got some sort of evil intent in any of this. I just think that they've failed to provide a reasonable upgrade path for their existing hardware customers. And the reason why I think that's so important is because you can't run their stuff any other way. <clears throat> Excuse me. And if you have one of these cards, you've invested some something in buying that software so that you could use it. So you're basically... Now, stuck with selling your existing, if you want to upgrade the computer, which yeah. I'm not ready to do, by the way. But if you wanted to, you would have to then sell your card privately, knowing that its value has dropped because it's not future compatible, yeah. in order to then buy a new piece of their hardware to run your existing purchased software. And I just think, in it's that a, case, it's incumbent upon them as a corporation to uh, want to keep their customers happy and i think that they probably hopefully they will i mean but it's just i think it's uh a shortcoming and i wanted to see what other people thought about it yeah i mean robbie you use don't you 
you're a you're yeah a i mean but that's that that news has been around since the mac pros were announced i mean that's that's been on their website for about at least two or three months but i mean um the thing that annoys me about it is that um like rich said it's particularly it's a particular sting for people possibly who've got like quad cards because if you had the uad quad which was the top of the range and quite a lot of people i know have two or three of those in their machine and they hadn't thought to bother to move to the opto cards that card is not compatible you know so perhaps if you had a solo card it's not quite as much of a sting but if you've got three quad cards like rich said that you may have only bought um a year less than a year ago I think it's really it's a real shame that they haven't offered, like you said, some sort of way of at least trading in those UAD quads for octos or something. Yeah, so you, you move forward exactly. You know, it's it's like it's like the old thing we all talk about, about you know, the, the Pro Tools in the past and always having to pay so much money. Generally, you UA Universal Audio have been great with all that kind of stuff, but I think it, this time it's a bit of a it's a bit of a smack in the face that, and I know it's for hardware reasons, but. I think they could do something for for all the users they've got. Well, um, just just for those of you who perhaps aren't fully available of the information, basically the new Mac Pro, which is the trash can one, uses a different. I don't know what FPGA that that's got something to do with the PCI bus. They use a slightly different controller chips or or structure, and it's basically they're not compatible. The cards in the older generation aren't compatible with the new Mac Pros. Uh, you know, they said they're not actually thrilled about it at all, and they've been trying as much as they can because obviously, you know, you could put it into a Thunderbolt chassis and what have you. But that, again, that's that's not going to work either. But it is worth saying that there is um, that you know as at least some movement towards it they what they've been doing is uh showing there's a there's an octo promotion so you can buy an octo and you get 750 dollars worth of uad plugins which is kind of mm -hmm. you know which is great if you're not orphaned, if you've got them all already but if you've got them all already it's probably not what you wanted to hear so yeah it, you know it, i guess it's a very tricky situation because i'd imagine in a lot of instances what happens with the hardware side of things is there's probably not all that much money to be made on the hardware and it's on the plugins so to, right. to trade in and do the hardware is going to be very difficult for a company to swallow because they've been shafted by Apple. But I agree, it's a nasty situation. Rich, sorry, you wanted to come in there. Well, it, it is exactly as you said, uh, unfortunate situation. And I'm hoping that they'll uh, come to grips with it and offer All they have to do is offer a few hundred bucks towards the upgrade to an Octo card to these people. And everybody feels like they've at least been acknowledged as customers. And when you do have a subscription service like that, where you're basically renting the software to run their cards, it makes sense for them to want to do that. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, maybe there's a, maybe there's, there should there should be some program for people who have you know X number of plugins or a, a lot of software already invested should get a different deal to people who are just going up from you know the bottom. So you can either have you know X number of dollars on plugins if you're going up and you haven't already got some. But if you've already got like most of the range, it's not necessarily going to help you. But maybe there's another sliding scale. It just requires perhaps I, a bit more thought. Sorry, I've yeah. got I've got I've got another op op option is um, just stop stop using UAD. I was in, I did <laughs> I was put into a mix project last week, so I spent a couple of days in a studio up in London and. We ended up stripping off. Oh, there was loads of UAD plugins on everything. And we every time we took them off, the tracks just sounded so much better. And well, that's not like, necessarily down to UAD. <laughs> that's not really fair. No, no, come yeah, on. But, but come hear on. me out. Hear me out. Those on, UAD plugins are so seductive. They're so sexy. The graphics of them. They look so. You know, it's like it's this is your magic. This is your magic plugin. And uh, I think uh, it's. It, it, I just can't, I mean, it's sorry. I'm being a bit. I'm being a bit facetious. This just happens to be a coincidence because my experience recently with UAD was the more I removed them, the better everything sounded. That could have just been down to the poor yeah. mix structure in the first yeah. place. But I, yeah. you know, I would like to say at this point, you know, obviously full disclosure uh universal audio are uh, uh, an advertiser on the site and i did contact them and ask them you know kind of for a comment on this and they said you know that they're, they're kind of pretty gutted and they you know they said please let people that they're not thrilled about this and it's been a really tough issue for them i'm guessing at this time you know globally i'm not saying that this is necessarily specific to uad but everybody is probably hurting in terms of financial turnover and what have you so you know anything that's likely to kind of cost i don't know whatever it might cost if you take 
200 bucks times X thousands of users, it starts to mount up pretty sharpish. But um, yes, yeah, so it may be that that could be revisited and, and they could maybe yeah, come up with another. It's not too late. But, but, yeah, hmm. go on. I, no, I just, I just wanted to say it's not too late for them to step up and do the right thing here. Sure. But in reality, the um, let's be let's be honest. You know, like we've talked about before, how many people are rushing out to buy Mac Pros? It's going to be the new ones. It's going to be a long, long old kind of transition, and that mm. is part of the hit of probably going to that system, like we talked about with Thunderbolt. But at the moment, there'll be a very buoyant second-hand market still for quad cards, etc. And so Mac Pros, yeah. In, yeah, if you're in a situation where you've got <laughs> possibly like two quads, um, you could probably sell two quads and pretty much pay for an Octo. At this time, yeah, that's probably true. Good, yeah. good, good, good. Uh, nice upside, okay, or uh, good. <laughs> but yeah, okay. So, Mark, yeah. Uh, I just want to say that I think that the problem isn't UAD; it's Apple. It's always Apple. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, come on, like you know, uh, with the PC, there's always backwards compatibility. With uh, all of these systems, there's backwards compatibility, apart from with Apple who radically changed their hardware and then turn around and say, oh, sorry, that's no longer compatible and shaft loads and loads of manufacturers and they do it with the iPad, the iPhone. Yeah. Why did they have to change from that 30-pin connector to that ridiculous little 8-pin thing that nothing seems to work with? Um, you know, It just goes on. It's just kind of... And they do it with all their laptops. They do it with all their desktops. And it's great to be on the leading edge of technology and to to kind of get hold of the best and the fastest and to build machines out of that, but to then just like drop stuff off. So, so, and it's not, it's not even, you know, like dropping and leaving old technology behind. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's the rapidity that, that they do it with. It's like, I've got a, I've got a six year lap, a six year old laptop in the, in the next room. That's incompatible with virtually everything. Now, if, if, if you've got Apple hardware and it's more than about, Three or four years old, you've had it. No, it's... well, I disagree there actually because I've got a, uh, a, my, my my our main computer here is more than three or four years old. It's probably five or six years old, and it runs perfectly fine. I mean, admittedly, I'm not. But it runs Mavericks. It. I don't know whether it will or not. I don't care. I don't want to run Maverick, so it, it's really irrelevant. And and to be fair, you know, but you get the. Hold on, hold on. So you wanted to. if you wanted to author iBooks. Yeah, you no, have we, we, we have. Come, I know you you, I know we, you, you've said this before, but I think the thing is, you know, with PC motherboards, you get incompatibilities with FireWire, you get incompatibilities with some USB devices. There are all sorts of other issues, and they're probably more difficult to figure out because they're slightly more random. So you get the, you know, whether you get the Texas Instruments FireWire chipset means it'll work with some FireWire devices and other. You know, you, there's always going to be this, but I do agree. You know, when when there's a swathing change, Apple don't have a great track record about this, but it's not purely apple that uh you know that this happens to either okay, so well, what about logic or audio then if you want to run pro x you have to run the latest version yes, of the operating agreed. system and if no, you want to load your old yeah, session yeah, and no. anything you did more than a few years ago you can't load them in because they dropped all support sure. for the old way of i know loading I, no, I, I think so I, like, I, I totally agree with you i think you know the thing is is you know we have covered this quite a lot in the past i don't want to kind of become too uh, bogged down in the the sort of Apple side of things, but yes, it's a main drag. I mean, it what ultimately it'd be great if uh, Universal Audio were able to to extend something a little further than they already have. That's linked to hardware rather than software, because for those people who've got a lot of quad cards, they've probably got a lot of plugins already. Anyway, hmm. so that said, uh, let's let's now get onto the portion of the program where we have a message from our sponsor. So uh, <laughs> talk amongst yourselves a moment. Oh, that's not it. I want to press that one. Yes, Isotope Iris, of course. Uh, you may recognise this. Uh, sponsor of the show. Iris, of course, uh, has its roots in Sonic Talk, where uh, the seed of an idea for a synthesizer from their spectral analysis uh, uh, of uh, RX was kind of turned into a synthesizer, four voice synth uh, four oscillator synthesizer. Natural intuitive selection tools, manipulate your audio visually, you can see an image of your sound, draw and select individual events, shape shifting, apply synthesis control to your selection, shape morph new textures, warm lush filters, delays, we have lots of effects for each layer, sound libraries as a mix of wood, glass, food, toys, voice, altered and prepared objects as well as crazy modular synthesizers, pitch percussion with the Iris expansion packs. You can download a free 10 day demo of Isotope Iris today at isodote.com forward slash iris. Uh, I think the sale's just finished, so I probably won't read that bit, but uh, it's it really is a, a unique way of looking at sound. And of course, what we also have 
is the winner of a competition, which I paid a couple of weeks ago. We posted, uh, let me see, I've got it here. We posted uh, the Isotope Irish competition, uh, in which you need to tweet out. So if you're not a member of Twitter, you could join just for this, because, I mean, the odds are pretty good. And for some reason, I think it must mean the summer summer breaks. Anyway, the winner is, this week, they've won Iris. And it's somebody called Drew Arigardas, at Drew Ag- Arigardas, uh, who, twit- who tweeted, uh, synthesize anything and son- at Sonic Nick and Isotope Inc. And if you want to do- we're going to do the same thing again this week. So if you want to win a copy of Iris, you certainly can. All you got to do is go join Twitter, tweet with the hashtag at Spectral Synth this week. Uh, at Sonic Nick and at Isotope Inc. Those are our addresses, so that it means that I can pick up. I've got a little filter running so we can see who did it. And you can win a copy of Iris. And once again, we thank them for their continued sponsorship of the show. (sighs) Right then. So, um, oh, while I was at it, actually, um, uh, uh, a Sonic Talk listener, Chris, I don't know his surname, but I know he's renovating a 2CV and he's listened to hundreds of hours of Sonic Talk while he does it. Uh, He sent me a handmade... Uh, Eurorack multi-mode filter, um, which I'm going to check out later. So I want to thank him very much for that. And uh, um, yes, just thought I'd bring that up. So thanks very much, Chris, uh, whoever you are. Uh, right, here we go. This is the uh, Slate Raven 2.0. Wow, what do you know? Stephen Slate here, um, Slate Digital. We've seen the MTI and the MTX con- console. They're very impressive touchscreen. Uh, here, Stephen is introducing, telling us how awesome. It's, it's a bit... It's a bit heavy sales to me, but what's really interesting about this is actually that the uh, let me just move this up. is the idea of these macros batch command system. Okay, now we're going to add some more tracks. Well, with a batch command, we can add some new tracks and then even automatically name them with one button. So let's name all these tracks background vocals. There are lots of examples of how batch, well, this is quite an impressive one. I select the entire drum track and hit the snap it batch command. So now this command is going to cut up each hit by the transient, then snap them all on the new grid, and then even fade each hit automatically. Let me say that again. In one button, this entire kick track will be sliced up by the transient and put on the grid and faded. And there he goes, and also console. I, I'm not, I won't play the whole thing, but it seems like that this is uh, the version two of the uh, of the Raven software, which is the control layer that uh, works integrates with the touchscreen. Over in that case, it was Pro Tools, but it'll work with other things as well. And um, the big sort of sell of this is the idea of batches so presumably there's some sort of macro recorder you hit buttons and you can just you know do things like put the same plugin across any number of selected tracks uh, all sorts of track views and filtering which does look actually pretty cool um i'm wondering um a if this makes any difference to anyone it seems to be you know the com- a lot of comments people sort of going hmm actually this is pretty cool this makes it more interesting and i wonder what people thought about that uh, i'll start with uh, maybe you rich i know you're not necessarily uh ready for the large format touchscreen but the the idea of batch control and batch commanding is kind of uh it's not new but it seems to be nicely executed right absolutely i have taken a lot of shots at steven slate over his coffee table mixer but um (laughs) this actually does a lot to make it more appealing to me because what he's doing is he's he, well, he's and as you say, it's nothing new. Qu- I was using quick keys to do this kind of stuff years ago, but um, it's cool to have it built into the functionality of his coffee table mixer. And uh, I was actually really impressed. I thought this was the coolest thing he's done with it so far. That is interesting that you think that that it's actually kind of got the. Um the extra functionality but uh, this this brought up an issue for me really which is more to do with why aren't we using you know this sort of stuff should a probably be built into pro tools anyway or any kind of daw or even into some os level sort of system oh, i know yeah. robbie yeah you sound I'll like you, the, the, the thing i the thing I, I i like most about that video was that right at the end when he went on about the batch command for rendering out all your files you know from a mix like totally consolidating all the little all the little chunks and putting them all together and basically making a session that can be taken into another DAW because the amount of time I spend at the end of every production running out files in real time it just is like watching paint dry so I'm, I'm with him on that if he can get that all working for logic yeah I wonder I wonder yeah. if the, the this stuff is working out so I mean it was all in impr- 
Yeah, it's all Pro Tools, isn't it, at the moment? That's the thing. I guess that's the biggest market. I mean, what was interesting is a lot of comments were going, come on, Avid, sort it out. You know, this guy should be working for you. (laughs) You know, really. (laughs) And that's the sort of thing that that, that really came across. And they do sort of have a point. I know, Gaz, you're a big fan of customising, you know, certainly Reaper and other things. Do do you get into the idea? I mean, when I start repeating myself, I think, is there a way I can batch this? Is there a way I could do commands? And I just can't help it. This sort of thing sounds really interesting to me. But there are alternatives, surely, than buying a 10 or, a, well, the big one, the MTX is 10 grand. Uh, this is pounds. And the uh, MTI, which is 27 inches, 1,500 quid, which is actually quite reasonable. But uh, there are other ways, surely. Well, you mentioned Reaper, and Reaper has just got such awesome um, batch control. You know, you can do anything you want and create these incredible batch processes and whatever, anything you want. It's so deep, the integration of that. And, of course, it's brilliant because you can just sign any MIDI control uh, as well as key controls to to operate it. So, um, But they are, you know, it does take time to set them up and blah, blah, blah. And, well, you know, I think what's great with this Raven thing, though, is it just... I, I don't know. It, it just feels like he, he's really understanding the workflow now. It just, um, I, I, I have to say, a bit like Rich, actually. I think you know this. I, I, I have, I have just kind of just gone ooh, just because. You know, I'm always always interested in in workflow, um, in in workflow uh, improvements. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. yeah for. For sure, um, but uh, so what does it? It, it does. Con- there is support for Logic X so for the Raven, isn't there? I think so, I think. but I'm not, I'm not sure how how deep. How, the, uh, how no, deep. Robbie, you you saw it, didn't you? You actually did. You get yeah, a Logic X? I, yeah, I went up to London and had a go on one, and um, yeah, it was it's it was still very fledgling when I've seen it. So I kind of thought I'm going to just leave it for a while and see how it develops because obviously. It, rightly so he's very passionate about developing it on the pro tools platform which is great but i i don't i you know like rich said i don't want to <laughs> buy into a very expensive coffee table for something that gets its support not not quite get the same support so yeah i was going to give it a year kind of just to see how it pans out really i'm guessing that there's a great uh quote uh, as your head uh in the chat room said uh batch cr- create hit <laughs> I quite like the look of that's a button that everybody needs, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Mark, I know you're not ma- perhaps the biggest fan of uh, Mr. Uh, Slate. Um, having, uh, I don't know actually, but this looks okay. kind of cool. I'm more his fan having watched that video. I mean, he's really thought about it and he's done some really clever stuff. And what and what. What I thought of as, well, I could just go and buy it. Well, the route I'm going at the moment is I've gone on the PC and I could just go and buy a touch screen PC and I can start to touch the screen. And that's, that's you know, I, I use an iPad and I know that I can do that on the iPad and I want to be able to do it on my main uh, workstation. But um, he's doing his, this, that, all that other stuff. I spend hours uh, creating like batch commands for things and actually having moved to the pc there's loads of this stuff you can do on the apple os yeah. uh, with automation and scripting that i don't know how to do on the pc but i do know how to do some of it on the on the mac and and if i and like you if i find uh things that i tend to do over and over i'll try and create common ways of doing it create batch scripts or create presets for channel strips all that sort of stuff but if if and but I, I but I know how to do that. And most producers want to produce music or record music or be engineers or whatever, and they don't know how to do that. And if he's creating these workflows for people and he's doing it as intelligently as that video seems to suggest, then he could be create he could be creating like that. Ex- you know what what the system should be doing anyway. I mean that is a very relevant point that Avid should employ him and that he should be building that stuff into well the there was also out. there was also suggestions that he should just buy pro tools <laughs> and develop which you know is perhaps not as, could, yeah. not as i'm sure he's probably not quite as uh, his company's probably not quite as valuable as the uh, market no, i mean i just that, but... you know overall impressed I, I i you know i kind of i hadn't seen the point of it up until now and i can i can really see a point you know that the, i love his marketing actually I'm not so sure I like the idea of being finished 
in the studio and home before dinner. Yeah. <laughs> that amused me. <laughs> right. right but, I mean, exactly. yeah, he's a clever guy. I mean, that, you know. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and having your assistants deal with all the uh, the polishing of the screen to make it uh, clean for the next day, etc. Uh, but but I mean, this raises you know, it's great, but it, but it, it's one of those brilliant pieces of re reinventing something that already exists and wrapping it into a product, which is what you know Apple yeah. have been doing for years with iPhone and I. You know, batch control. There were a couple of things I actually found. What was it? There's a um, there's this one for OS X, which is what? This is macro recorder for Mac. This is kind of something that you can do, which will do screen cap. It's the sort of thing that people seem to be making uh, viruses to take control of your computer and do key logging. But it's the sort of thing that, you know, in fact, is incredibly useful. I think there's also one for PC, uh, macro recorder by J- Jitbit, same sort of thing. I mean, obviously, right. you'd want to buy it from a reputable dealer because you don't want to be sending all that What's information. What's the thing that... What's the thing that's built into OS X? That's called Automator. Yeah, or something, it's Apple isn't Script it? essentially. It, um, it's an yeah, Apple because they've been doing that. Oh God, what am I doing? I'm not sure. Uh, it makes it like building blocks, doesn't it? It sort of almost makes it like uh, writing stuff in a a language, except it ma- it's very block oriented. The last time I used it. Well, we use we use Apple Script a lot. In fact, this is Apple Script. All of that Ooh. happens via everything that the the show is controlled via Apple Script. You know, I Apple Script things to output MIDI to various devices for controlling the recording, for the switching, all of those things. You know, so it's all done. You know, it's it, it's a very useful thing. I mean, there are some things applications need to be very Apple Script aware to be able to do certain things like execute menu commands and all of those things. And some of them are a bit arcane, but it does raise that wider issue that you know this should be at OS level. It should be application level because. You know, basically, why do I need to buy uh, a fifteen hundred dollar, uh, sorry, fifteen hundred quid or ten thousand pound touchscreen to get this kind of automation? It's sort of irrelevant to the, to the software. Should be happening, and it's it. But it seems to me, maybe perhaps there's not as big an appetite as one thinks because I mean, obviously, this stuff has been available. We're all professionals. Do we use it? No, we don't. You know, really. So, I oh, did. well, you did actually. I take that back. I'm sorry, Rich. Quite you, a bit. <laughs> and, and how come uh, you don't in, in use- 1989 I was scripting software alchemy using quick keys controlling an EPS over SCSI between a nice. Mac Pro or, or whatever the Mac SE thing was at the time and uh and in Sonic samplers I I used to script all kinds of stuff that I didn't feel like having to execute eight keystrokes to do 500 times I suppose so but what my point is is you know, when you were saying like it would be cool to have these features that that Stephen, mm-hmm. how come you you're not doing it now? Is it not possible, or is it just you know something that you moved away from? Well, because I'm the existing sets of keystrokes are actually fairly comprehensive to me. There are one of two things I used to use Quick Keys with Pro Tools on that yeah. I just haven't bothered to use it lately because Quick Keys itself became so unwieldy, and I just decided I didn't really want another layer laying over right. the top. But I think. Even when I was working with Mark in 2002, I'm pretty sure I was using Quick Keys. And uh, yep. I used to do some yeah, really I cool stuff, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, all that stuff you showed me, the putting stuff on grid, is mind blowing, actually. I mean, it's like I, I, I well, didn't know you. how to do that stuff before, and being able to do it all and nudging stuff around and multi track and all that sort of stuff. Very clever. You were a very well, it's clever way man. faster now. <laughs> it's way faster now. Thank you. <laughs> I'll have to come and watch you then. Maybe I've I need another new, lesson. I've got new ways of doing it, and uh, <laughs> they actually sound even better. Oh, well, cool. This... Sorry, Gaz. Oh, I, um, I was going to say, certain things I'd like to see in more uh, uh, um, available in other DAWs uh, that you can map to quick keys. Like, uh, I really like, um, like one thing in Reaper is that wherever the mouse is hovering, without having to actually select the thing, just, just wherever the mouse is pointing at, you can have you can sort of do various um, processes. Like, for instance, mute under mouse, uh, you know, so whatever the mouse happens to be. So you can uh, you can just drag boxes and mute or you, or whatever the mouse is, just mute without having to click. Or, or um, And I, uh, the, and there's numerous other things like that as well. Um, and, and I just wonder whether... Um, uh, whether the selection, or, you know, when when you're dealing with tools, if you're working with shortcuts and working with tools, um, uh, like, well, sorry, I'm kind of banging on about Reaper here, really. Um, when you use Reaper, you can assign 
like wherever the in the waveform you can assign what clicking at the top part of the waveform does to the waveform, what clicking in the bottom of the waveform does to the waveform, what clicking at the right of the waveform, what, you know, uh, you could really get, and you can assign very complex processes. Um, like, for instance, you can just sort of select a, re a region of sound and then just adjust the automation. Uh, or the clip with, gain, right. Okay, all with sort uh, of... No, no, not not the clip gain, just the actual automation lanes as well, and just mm, tasty, fast stuff that other DAWs. It just seems to be. I think every click you can save, then you know that right. does equate to. Uh, what's that? What's the old saying? A click in time saves nine or something. Something like that. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> like uh, uh, eminently sensible. It'd be interesting, actually. Well, I think we might try and get an article together of how automator or keys can, uh, you know, automation yeah. can can help in music production. You know, because I think that would uh, that might be quite interesting. Um, I mean, I for, even Ableton being able to assign different things to different keys, I find that incredibly helpful, especially MIDI keys. I bought a MIDI footboard so that I can I can play and loop the guitar, so I don't actually have to put the guitar down or even let go of the guitar. Now I just stamp on the next track and uh, and do it all with my feet, which has been a revelation to me, really. But hmm. um, so anything that anything that makes it so that you just have to touch one thing to do it has got to be good yeah i think you're right i mean i think and i think all of these things there just needs to be tighter integration i mean you know computers can do so much and they should be doing so much they should be doing th I, that's the one thing i when i find uh, certainly in uh, in video editing software we use sony vegas there's uh, this whole way of getting into the program and creating these scripts that uses the net framework i don't know enough about it but you can do amazing stuff with that and it, it really pains me to see people editing things by kind of going like this going to a menu selecting a whole thing down to here to a sub box when it's just like one key command so like, I, I just it just drives me mad because i'm thinking that's like 90 percent more time than that actually needs to take you know you, those are the sort of things that i try and help people you know i guess it's probably me that's probably more annoyed than they are but they find that you can be so much more productive if you if you get away from your normal procedural way of using software and think okay i'm going to learn some key commands today and just you know take 10 minutes to go and go right there must be a way of doing this quickly because a lot of the time people don't know, you know, and you just go, oh, look, I could just do that. That's brilliant. I'll do that again. Or if I select all of those things and do that, fantastic. I don't have to do one at a time. I've done them all at the same time. All of those things are very, very useful, I think. Um, anyway, let's, uh, if you want to buy the Stephen Slate thing, you can head over to um, the various different, uh, let's see, oh, there's something, uh, oh, no, I haven't got it here. But there, there, there are distributors everywhere and uh, you could buy them. I think you have to pre-order the MTX, which is the, big big one which is still 1080 but the 27 inch mti which looks like the sort of thing i'd be interested in is about 1500 quid if that's what you desire uh, or you could buy some macro key software where Perhaps. where where is it 1500 quid nick i seem to only be able to find it for two two thousand two hundred dollars or pounds no pounds uh where did i find it i went rave uh, oh actually it was on uh, guitarcenter.com Showing it in dollars, showing in um, US pa uh, UK pounds. So maybe that's probably plus VAT. Yeah, you've got to pay import duty and VAT and everything on that, though. Yeah, you? that's you, true. Okay, no? I take it back. It's still a couple of grand. <laughs> <But> <laughs> two grand then. Mm. Um, or, or put it in a big suitcase when you come back from the US. Yeah, you're going to the US, aren't you? Yeah, I don't think I've got any room for one of those, though. No, perhaps not. Right, okay, let's see what we're. Um, uh, let's see what, what else we can bring to the show. Uh, oh, that's a bit back to me. Um, we could go to the BBC TV auctions. Anybody interested in that? Or we could do uh, which kick drum mic, which I thought was kind of interesting, or the Focusrite Studio. You can let's go kick drum mic. Um, there is no video, there is no video to play, but it just struck me that there was a, it was a question um, <coughs> that came up on Reddit. Which uh, there's a Reddit synthesizers group, by the way, which is actually. Uh, doing very well if you're interested in talking about synthesizers go to reddit and search for synthesizers there's a group there um that was contacted by the admin who uh, told me uh, to come and check it out and i found a couple of topics there and they seem very uh they're really kind of into being mentioned on sonic talk and you know you know us having some interaction so do, do check that out um kick drum mics yeah i was uh looking at now let me see where was it there's this one i looked at which has kind of looked interesting this is an se electronics sex1d and it's got a titanium capsule 
Uh, it's the, follows the form of all of their stuff. And apparently this is the... So this is actually a condenser. And I remember back in the day when I used to do a lot of live sound, you know, all recording, you'd have D112, which I think sound horrible, uh, 421... Or uh, if you were lucky and you could get somebody to bring one in, an uh, uh, Electrovoice RE20. And they were all dynamic mics, I guess. But that's changed quite a lot. Um, that would be for live. I mean, you wouldn't want to put something, you know, condenser mics weren't really gig worthy when I was doing live sound. So you wouldn't really want to put one of those on stage. Um, I know, Rich, you probably, I uh, will go, go to you first. Uh, sorry, that's not Rich. Uh, just purely because you probably are recording kicks or have recorded kicks perhaps more than I have. Uh, in recent years or days or weeks, what would you reach for generally, or would it depend? Well, it depends. Um, and we don't do a lot of kicks at Niall's place, so I'm usually out looking at somebody else's mic cabinet when I go to do them. But it just so happens that I was recently at Telefunken, US, ah, yes. which is very close to here. And while I was there having our uh, precious U48 serviced, they were showing me a brand new microphone of theirs called M82, which is a dynamic kick drum microphone, specifically engineered for kick drum uh, and for broadcast vocals. It's an end address microphone that kind of looks like a U47, so it's a little deceiving. And they had a video, though I didn't hear this thing live, of it against about seven or eight other kick drum mics, including the Audix, the Shure, and a bunch of other ones, uh, AKGs and such. And both the M82 and the Audix, I'm not sure if it's C6 or C7, I don't remember, but they both sounded wonderful. The M82 really did sound great. And uh, so if I were buying one today, I might buy this Telefunken one. Hmm. Is it a pricey article, or is it? Uh, Not if I, I mean, as I recall, no. It's in a few hundred bucks kind right. of range. And it's a, it's a, it's a, a condenser, right? No, it's a dynamic. It's a dynamic. Oh, okay, interesting. Hmm. Gaz, you probably are recording, you know, real instruments as well. I mean, uh, um, yeah. Do you generally? I mean, I know you're quite a big fan of you know minimal recording techniques, but I mean, presumably you would probably try and capture the the kick drum at least as a discrete signal, right? Yeah, I. I as I've gone on through, I, I, I'm really much more of the Glyn Johns kind of school of drum mic in a pair of overheads and a kick drum mic. But uh, I've really gone off multi-mic drums. Even though it does sound great, I just feel that you just spend a disproportionate amount of the time of the set. You know, if, if you, get, you know, the amount of time you spend on a big drum mix and if you've got loads and loads of mics. I used to love that, but I just realized in the end you'd spend sort of three quarters of the time you know on the drum mix whereas if you get the overheads right and obviously the kick right then that's great so i i i, I change uh, depending on a few circumstances i tend to like the microphone to be outside of the drum you know outside of the kick drum and uh, and therefore i like a kind of condenser on the mic on the the kick drum i remember one time using a neumann u67 on a kick and and making sure that it was safely sort of off off axis, but boy, that was a lovely sound. That really sounded good. Um, I remember uh, I haven't used one, but um, Audio Technica brought out the was it the A five hundred, and that was quite an interesting mic in that it's got two capsules in it. It's specifically for kick drums, and it's got a condenser capsule and a dynamic capsule, and it's there's a kind of a, uh, there's like a five pin XLR that comes off it that then splits, so you actually you record the the two separate signals off it, the dynamic and the and the condenser as separate channels, which I think I think is quite a good idea. I'd like to try that. I that's think, yeah, that's it. I think I think I've seen that mm. um, again. You know, um, this titanium capsule kind of idea is supposed to be very. Uh, it just seems fitting, doesn't it? You've got this sort of really <laughs> very strong diaphragm, and you're putting it in front of something which is capable of massive air movement and. Uh, uh, what have you. I don't, I don't know that it necessarily follows that it would sound good, but I suppose it's robust enough to deal with it. Um, I don't know. I've never tried a titanium capsule one, but um, maybe we'll get one in for review. I was hoping to. I know. Uh, what about you, Robbie? I'm guessing your, most of your kicks are of the electronic variety, but... Uh, um, I mean, I mean, uh, the very few times I ever get to record real drums, I don't pretend that I'm any expert, so I would go and get someone else to help me do it. Because uh, I do it so rarely. Yeah, uh, I, I know. I'm too much of a control freak. 
I just want to be doing everything. Uh, <laughs> I know what you're saying. Uh, that, that, uh, actually, so that, it's it's um yeah, it's not it's not it's it's totally outside of my sphere. But I do remember when I was when I was in a band and we had one of those horrible D12s. How awful I used to think it sounded. Yeah, it just sounds like so, wool. The best thing the drummer ever did was buy a D drum kit, in my opinion. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, yeah. In the chat room, um, it's uh, Sonic6086 says NS10 is a pretty decent kick mic. And that's actually true. Um, mm -hmm. that in fact, Yamaha, what you can do is you can take, like, it's an 8-inch speaker, I think, isn't it? Or 7-inch speaker. And you can wire it so that the air that's moved, it catches the sub. So you that you turn that into a signal and, and amplify it. And, that's, and the magnet, I think, amplifies the signal. And in fact, Yamaha built a kind of NS10 mounted kick drum mic that you put there and that's the thing you catch this just the, the real woof to it i know it sounds a bit perhaps a bit lame but uh, uh, that's assuming if you haven't got a u87 or a u67 which seems to be very much uh, what people go sounds lovely but you wouldn't put that anywhere near <laughs> someone who you really need to know what you're doing because you don't want to break the diaphragm on those things because that's going to cost you an absolute mint right i know uh, mark any thoughts on this subject well, it's funny you should say that i mean the best drum sound i've ever heard was recorded by ken scott in abbey road and he put u87 on every single tom i can't remember what he used on the kick though and this kit went up and i was like wow that sounds brilliant and what what have you done with the eq nothing it was just like mm. all these u87s i was like what are you going to do if the drummer hits hits a u87 i was thinking oh my god i mean he didn't but yeah you um, need to trust your drummer but, wouldn't you so i would do that because i just love the sound of that but I wouldn't do it with like lots of them. I'd probably just stick a, a really nice mic up in the room and something that sounded as close to a U87 as possible and record the drum kit sounding like a drum kit because I want it to sound like how I hear it with my ears when I walk into a room and hear someone playing the drums. If I wanted to close mic it, if I wanted to close mic a kick drum, I would either use a Seducer tape mic, which I might even stick on the skin right. so it collects the trigger and then i might even trigger a sample with it uh, or the other thing that's actually really brilliant for recording kick drums is a tandy PZM, about a 30, mark, pound, yeah. 30 or 40 dollars tandy pzm you put it on a bloody great big board in front of the bass drum and with the pzm right in the middle of the the center of the bass drum basically and it picks up loads of bottom end the bigger the board the better because uh, I think the bass frequency roll off on those mics is uh, is uh, proportional to the size of the boundary of the microphone, and the size of the boundary is basically how big a board you put it on. And you get right. a lovely sound for that. Really, yeah. Lovely. No, I've heard that. Uh, you are nodding sagely there, Rich. Do you use P PZMs for that technique? I mean, that would. Count. I guess you could use that for, but. Uh, bottom end i think you're muted actually mate um <laughs> you could you can use but you can use it for um bases all sorts of things that just kind of pick up the extra low end right right i don't use it but he's absolutely right and everything mark said was right so i was sitting here nodding because ah. mark's the man. <laughs> but it was very much the um that you know contact marks were very much in vogue and there was because ta it was tandy or maplin's uh, tandy or radio shack used to sell them i remember they were like 25 quid i got one somewhere and there was a modification you had to do with them to make them accept phantom power rather than eat pp9s which is what they or pp3s which is what you used to get through endlessly with those things, stick, it's invariably... a lithium battery that's half the size of an aa that you can stick in it as well that doubles, oh, right. oh, no, it puts about eight volts into it right you don't want to have oh, to have a PP3 hanging off the side of it. Yeah. Well, you always, it forget, was, you always forget to turn them off. Sorry, go, Rich. It was Crown that developed the PCM originally. That's right. And and yeah. uh, the technology was then sold also through Tandy, much uh, like Moog synthesizers. I've, much we, like Moog synthesizers were sold through Tandy. That's true. Oh, look, Gaz, as in fact... Were they? He's reached. There's the there's oh. the there's the PZM. That's the realistic <laughs> PZM, folks, modelled there by by Gaz. What were they originally <laughs> for? You, weren't you supposed to put them on a table or something, and they just pick up sort of the ambient sound? Was that the kind of? I, I think that's what they the were originally designed that, for. They were originally designed to eliminate this. If I'm talking over here, the sound changes, right? If I'm over here, the sound changes because. The microphone's picking up my direct voice and it's picking up reflections from the things around it. So by making the microphone 
capsule very close to a reflective surface, it means that any reflections that come in from anywhere all get bounced into the mic at, by the same tiny, tiny little amount. Off, so it's reflected off that, that boundary plate underneath, which means that uh, there's no phase relationships happening to cancel each other out. Like when I go over here, the, the, the stuff being bounced off the walls in my kitchen is cancelling out different frequencies in my voice as I move around. So it was designed so that you could move around and stand anywhere and it would still sound the same. That's the idea behind ah, it. So is it kind of similar to an Omni? Um, mm. No, because an Omni is still picking up reflections from everything around it. The boundary mic's only picking up the reflection off that plate just underneath so the microphone doesn't point out into the room the microphone points right. down onto the plate so the sound comes in ah. hits the plate bounces off the plate into the mic so even if you've got stuff that's um that's bouncing off the walls it can never get out of phase with itself or it can't, you can't get any of those weird kind of phase shifting things happening or less of it because it's such a tiny distance between the capsule and the plate underneath Right. Okay. Well, I, I didn't know that. That's. I might have to. Re I think I've got one somewhere. I might have to revisit it. I don't know if it still works or whether I have still got it. But I'm gonna check that out. Seems like something that you just tape on a wall somewhere and uh, and see what. I think yeah, they used they to, they used to mean, use them as audience mics in uh, the club I used to work where they did live recordings a lot. I seem to remember. So you'd have ambient mics for those. Uh, yeah. Gaz, was that something you wanted oh. to come in with? Sorry. <laughs> Only just for a period of time, it was the only mic I had, so I did. Ev I, I recorded everything with it. I was, I was, I'd be singing into it, you know. I'd be kind of trying to sing into it quite close by and try not to get sort of wind noise onto it. But um, I used it for uh, everything, literally everything. And funnily enough, those recordings I made, they sound all right, actually. You know, they sound. They've got a lot of presence, that's for sure. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Now that's good news. Um. Right, I think perhaps um, because it's now um, five o'clock, I think maybe the thing to do is uh, I, just in case you were interested, there was there's a Focus Right Studio console film. I think we'll probably leave that for now because um, I wanted to give Robbie a chance to um, show us his um, his video, which I think I put oh. here. This is so. This is what you just just to run us. This is what you've been working on to, for your live rig, right? So yeah, gonna... so I've got one, and Howard's got a similar one, a bit different because he's got a big master controller in his. All right, I'll, uh, yeah. I'll play it now, and then we can you can talk us through it. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's very futuristic. So that's a, a a machine on one side and a push on the other. What's that there? Is that a monitor? That's mix? a Roland M48. It's the personal mixer for um that goes with the V mixing system. Ah, uh, okay. Ooh, check it out. And so it's got um it's got these LED strips. We've got LED strips built in, but they're special wireless. Um, yes, oh, you uh, showed LED us, didn't you? You showed us yeah. when we so yeah. that, that so they can they got RGB ones. They look pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, so but they but they but they they're totally addressable via DMX wirelessly. So our lighting guy is going to be able to incorporate all sorts of different effects and lighting things that go with the whole stage lighting into them. Ah, they, they, I tell you what, it reminds me of you know. Remember the, those things on Tomorrow's World, which were like these big perspex boxes with with oil and water. So when you tilt them, you get these sort of wave machines. Oh yeah, going on. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know where they came from, but that, they, that looks but I mean, really. It's, it was a real baptism of fire getting this made in acrylic because there's so many things you can't do with acrylic. Because, like for instance, you can't cut square holes because where the two angles join at the right angle, it, it's prone to splitting. So everything has to have little curves and ellipses and all this kind of thing so it's been quite an interesting kind of journey to try and get them one light enough so that they can go in cases and not be over the flying weight and two strong enough that they're not going to fall apart at the first gig yeah i so can I, imagine but i think we're gonna i think they're i think they're work, gonna work really well we're just gonna have to roadies are gonna have to be very careful with them they're gonna be scratch yeah Stop, no, don't put any stickers on them but the good thing about it is is literally we can bring the rig straight out of the flight case and um Play Apart it again. Thinking, I'm going to have that wall of launch pads behind me as well. So just link one USB cable to that and power it up, and then a couple of looms come out the side, and it's all wired up, ready to go. So oh, yeah, it's going to be a lot less work than I had before as well. And you're using um, mm -hmm. the push live a lot, right? Yeah, push is for all my kind of Ableton 
um, proper launching of scenes and clips and stuff like that. And then Machine, I've actually set up as a generic MIDI controller because I actually went through loads of different MIDI controllers, worked wanting to find something that had full colour pads but was also velocity sensitive and had knobs on it. And there was nothing out there. And then I suddenly realized I've got machines sitting in front of me in the studio. And if you use their on, if you use their dedicated editor, you can do absolutely anything you want with it as a controller. So it's brilliant for that. Ah, so. neat. Cause you, so the launch pads, uh, aren't velocity sensitive, are they? They're just, no. So the launch pads I've got behind me, they'll, they'll be doing various, um, feedback things. And also, allowing me to change filters and volume which i'm assigning to them and then i'll be able to then um do all the clip launching from the push and then kind of more bespoke stuff on them on the machine like controlling sugar bites tornado and stutter edit and stuff like that kind of kind of more kind of mashing stuff up right um, and then the keyboard in the middle i use for playing extra keyboard parts and stuff when howard goes out the front i can take over keyboards and stuff as well wow so, yeah. Very futuristic. Are you not not tempted to maybe put bring it back and stick it in your studio and uh, maybe? Uh, you well, know, it is it. very nice. I must admit, I did once. I put all once we actually got everything in there and what and turned it all on. I just stood there looking at it for about fifteen minutes, going, "Oh, this is so good." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah, very pleased. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if anyone has any questions because I know Mark, you were very impressed. You you said you I were going to really give up impressed. your gold star. <laughs> yeah, I said I'd take off my little McDonald's employee badge. Mark is the sampling champion of the universe. I need to put that down for a bit and come up with something clever because that was really cool. What's it made yeah. of? It's made of um, it's made of opaque acrylic, five mil acrylic. Oh, so, okay. Uh, yeah, so it's so that's why all the obviously the light can get kind of diffused through it. Mm. So um, yeah, it looks really nice. I mean, it just uh, why don't people, uh, why don't more people do things like that? I mean, it's it's yeah. Well, the thing is, I've been like I've been a touring unique with all kind these of signature piece, isn't it? It's artistic yeah. and it's nice. It's just yeah. And I love well, the idea that it will. So many controllers you're, and they've just been sorry? a mess. But you, we've been um, touring with so many controllers. I've had a setup with all sorts of controllers on it and made of like this Meccano stand. And it looked kind of cool, but it was an absolute pain in the ass to set up. And there were so many cables and it's all on display. And it's just so much more elegant. And like you say, kind of gives you a bit of identity if you can do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a very definite aesthetic with the band. And the drummer's got an electric kit with um, custom acrylic pink cymbals and... Yeah, it's just oh, you know nice. it gives you it gives you a look you know that kind of I mean, is different. To if you else. go back to the eighties, like the Fairlight was so utterly iconic that anybody that used one just had this kind of it had that kind of scientific appeal and something about it. And and I think the coloured buttons on these new co ranges of controllers that do like the pinks and the blues and all those things are iconic as well. But to like kind of you've taken that theme and then themed it through the whole kit it's just so cool i really like it <laughs> excellent yeah yeah so um uh, i had a question there and it's just completely gone um but i'm sure it'll come back at some other point after the show's finished perhaps uh, there was uh, briefly um uh, the chat room seems to be uh, uh demanding that we uh, mentioned the uh, BBC Orchestra, the BBC Auction. Uh, I've got a little video, actually. This is basically two guys who used to work at the Television Centre in uh, England, Sh uh, Shepherd's Bush in London. Massive, great, uh, sort of iconic building where it opened in 1960 and has just closed in 2013. And there's a, uh, there's a phase one auction that's selling all the technical stuff, the backroom things like the control room stuff. And it, there's, uh, there's tons of it. Let's see if I can find... There's a PDF I've got here of... Uh, where is it? Oh, there it goes. The auction online, and uh, uh, it's starting the end of. And there's some just some great things. Some Coles ribbon mics. There's loads of furniture. There's some Colrec desks. There's all things. But I'll start with this video because these two guys went back and uh, and just sort of visited the building that they worked in for a while, uh, as they call it, Auntie Beeb. Um, yeah, the old auntie is what it's uh, known as. I'll see if I can zoom this forward a little bit. That's the building. I decided to go for a day out today, reminiscing around an old place I used to work, the BBC Television Centre here in Sheffield. This is Jamie Langton and a producer friend of his called Neil Armstrong. Not the, uh, not the guy who went to the moon, I might add. 
but they had a tour around this. It's really quite sad because, I mean, you look at this sort of massively empty building. And if you're a UK or you maybe watch a lot of World Service, you'll kind of understand the, um, you know, the, 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 the aspect of this that's because it's it, for this it's sort of the home of many 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 of our uh, childhood films were made that looks like the blue peter garden good grief um which again will mean nothing to anybody in the u.s <laughs> which look very nonplussed but just there's ah oh, look that that's this massive these massive studios that just kind of they're all going to go i don't know what they're going to do with the building but there's an auction of all the stuff collective I would dearly love to own some of the clocks and things, you know, to have here. I would like a big BBC on-air sign so I can put it outside. But it's interesting. I don't know. Do, Rich, in the US, are there are, are there sort of large, na not national, um, TV studios that are still operational? Most of those closed down. A lot of these things have kind of disappeared and, and turned into, you know, into much more viable uh, and uh, commercially viable um, housing property <laughs> than than anything else, right? I just I don't know that much about the uh, video recording spaces. I do know, for example, that the Tenth Avenue Hit Factory Recording Studios is now Hit Factory Condominiums. Uh, uh, you know, um, so I can speak a little bit to the recording studio spaces, but. As for video studio spaces, I just don't know that much about it in the U.S. However, the building that you just showed was pointed out to me last year when I was in London driving by, and it was explained to me how it had formerly housed the BBC Broadcast Centre. I would so love to have a wander around in there. I know, Gaz, have you ever been there and played? Um, yes, uh, not for a long time, but this, they sm oh, there's a smell in that place. Lovely. Does it smell I don't like know the what they use. Do you sm I don't does it smell if... like the inside of an old radio, by any chance? Uh, it's just a really evocative smell. And uh, Ma Maid of Vale's got the same smell as well. You know, that, that's BBC's, um, you know, um, recording, uh, audio recording studios, uh, which I'm not sure what the fate of Maid of... I think Maid of Vale's closing as well, isn't it? Uh, well, I know Will Gregory uh, went and did a session there with uh, the Moog Orchestra uh, a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. so... I don't know if it is closing. I mean, the thing is, they're going to need a studio in London because, I mean, if they're doing lots of live recorded music, I mean, that's where a lot of the bands are going to be coming through. So it makes sense to keep that. I don't know whether the, mm. what the plans are, though. But, uh, I remember um, there was some clear out of, of the BBC in Llandaff, uh, the, the Welsh, uh, the, uh, the um, BBC's, uh, of BBC Wales is HQ in uh, Cardiff, in Llandaff and Cardiff. And... Um, I'd gone there for an interview with my band and we came out and we saw this skip and in the skip all this fantastic stuff was being put in the skip. Uh, big Calrec preamps uh, and <laughs> all sorts oh of groovy Yeah, all sorts of groovy stuff. So we started just loading everything out of the skip into the van that we'd come in. Anyway, then the holy security guards all came running down. Oh, 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 stop, stop, stop. And then someone went in the road to stop us driving off and they kind of and we're going, but it's in the skip, you know. And they said, no. Nah. And then they said, no, the problem is with it is, is that um, anything that's got a BBC, has it got a power supply in it and it's got like a kind of BBC stamp on there, then it's illegal for anything to be taken away. It has oh. to go to this other place. Oh, and it was this whole bureauc bureaucratic element that you'd have to go through. And it was just a, essentially get it from the tip oh, oh gutted man. gutted did you not manage yeah. to keep anything no oh. no they were really they were it was you could see the security guards were really pleased you know they had some had something action. to do oh, <laughs> yeah. I saw, that's awful mark you, uh, have, you have a you must have been to a television center in the past with uh, the durands possibly or other i bands? have been to television I have been to television centre on different occasions for different things. Yeah, and my partner, Gina, uh, worked, when I first met her, she worked in the BBC for years, actually. So uh, we used to go to the BBC bar, actually, which is riotous, or used to be riotous. And uh, and also the BBC canteen. And I, I actually think that the smell that you smelled through the building was probably them cooking... <laughs> some Scott dinners. Pea soup or something. <laughs> yeah. um, I've been to the new one as well. I went to the new. There's a new building, isn't there, near Oxford Circus? Oh. I went there about a year ago, I think, and went all around there. But that's much more people sitting around at desks with ah. computers, kind of based than 
than any real. I mean, there are studios know. there, but it's just I, the not only, the same I, kind of feel. I mean, it's everything's just got so small now, hasn't it? I mean, yeah. uh, that that PDF with all those racks and racks and racks and racks of gear, which are basically modems or ways of sending uh, radio, bouncing radio signals around the country, all that stuff is completely obsolete. Look at it. Yeah. Um, Look at all of that Shame stuff. about the Calrec preamps, though. I mean, it's, it is just... There's so much red tape in the BBC. Uh, you try and get well. It's publicly owned, I suppose, isn't all. it? So you... it's probably uh, they have to dispose of it correctly or whatever it may be. Look at that. Oh, they, yeah, absolutely. There's and just... there's probably some huge health and safety thing around every single thing as well, you know. Oh, look at all those DAT machines. Jesus. <laughs> CDs. Extraordinary, isn't it? Really. It is. It's just those clocks. Ah, oh, that's the one I want. I want that one there. Oh, uh, yeah. That thing. I quite like some of the microphones. Yeah, There's I would a have good that. range of microphones on there. Robbie, you been? You been to uh, Television Centre or any of those places with you must have? Yeah. yeah, I've been there in the past, yeah. I mean, yeah, but like, like Mark said, it, I looked at that gear and I just thought, how much of this gear is of any use to most people? I mean, there's like lo loads of stuff that just looks like it's out of some old 1970s sort of sci-fi film in some control room somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, so I mean, yeah. What do you think? Do you think they'll actually make a lot back from a lot of that stuff? I have no idea. Um, th I think the mics and the car wreck desks will probably yeah, be over stuff. Kind of stuff, and there'll be a certain memorabilia aspect to it. Um, you know, yeah, I guess. There we go. Look, that floral sofa. Mm. I'm not sure about that, <laughs> uh, but you know, you could have a little piece of BBC chair. Look, some Herman Millers there. And uh, all this stuff. Yeah, what's that? Oh, look, a load of recycling <laughs> bins. <laughs> oh, it's just, yeah, a lot of it's going to be tat, isn't it? But I'm presumably this is this is phase one. I don't know what's going to be happening in phase two, but uh, maybe it'll be something great. But it's sort of, it always feels, it just feels a little bit of a shame, I suppose. But, um, you know, as with all of these things, they all move on and they do get broken up. I mean, you know, obviously, I, mean, I guess, Rich, you've got a load of modules that uh, kind of probably came from, you know, larger Neve consoles or whatever. You know, that's just the way that things work. Did you have some... Someone... Oh, sorry. If you... I'm not sure. I don't know whether you did, Rich, or not. Did, did you got some Neve stuff, or is it all in a BCM format? We have some vintage Neve stuff. We He has some vintage uh, Pultic stuff. We have uh, API EQs. Things we've gathered over the years. Presumably a those... Neve console. Yeah, ah, right, okay. And presumably a lot of that, some of those things are actually kind of bits of, would have been bits of larger format consoles or what have you that, that tends to happen with a lot of these things. Like Certainly with Neve preamps and EQ sections and what have you usually are taken from larger pieces that are no longer... It's in... possible. They appeared in my life in generally in these custom-built yeah. uh, racks uh, that had been assembled prior to my arrival. So I don't know exactly where they came from. Well, uh, actually, the APIs, the APIs, I do know from whom we bought them, but I don't know where they came from before he sold gotcha. them to him, to us as is. Well, anyway, that sort of probably brings us to the end. I've got a. I was uh, just, uh, yep. I was just going to say, I noticed somebody said in the chat room that they'd like to have some stuff from Blake Seven, but the <sighs> way I remember it is that. All of those props and stuff just used to be kicking around the BBC, rotting, and nobody really looked out for them. And I just think overall the BBC have a, a pretty poor lack of foresight with some of these things. And they'll probably, no doubt, sell off loads of things that they'll suddenly realise in 10 or 15 years' time were really important. And then they'll try and get them back, like Doctor Who episodes. Mm. Let's just throw all the tapes away yeah that's a good idea yeah right only cost a few hundred thousand each episode to make why would well, we need still to keep loads the tapes? Of missing yeah there's loads of missing episodes you know like it's just uh, yeah i don't know all that They're red tape and landfill then it, somewhere <laughs> sorry yeah probably i mean landfill yeah, yeah they are it's terrible but, when know. we we when we did the remasters of howard's back catalog we found out that loads of warner's remasters literally ended up in some landfill by the side of a motorway somewhere. Oh. Yeah, the Duran ones were in a big a drain, literally. Like this big kind of wet <laughs> drain where they all got... EMI had just kind of jammed them all, which basically are like a, or a storm drain kind of thing, which was like their kind of dumping ground for things they didn't think were important anymore. So, um, wow. 
Well, all moldy uh, and melted. What can we say? But um, I, I really do have to uh, bring things to an end just because uh, I've got some more stuff to do. And uh, because of my new uh, form, I have to drink uh, three or four of these a day. And um, I have been. And I need to leave quite soon. I have matters <laughs> to attend to. <laughs> Join the club. I'm on a juice fast. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I want to say, well, we'll go to you and your juice uh, Robbie Williams, yeah. uh, Robbie Bronneman, what the Robbie hell am I thinking? <laughs> Did it again. Thank well, you very much for joining. I don't know, I had his money and his looks and everything else. <laughs> yeah, but he hasn't got one of those neat rigs, looks. though, has he? No, exactly. Yeah. So, Robbie, yeah. thank you very much for joining us. Sorry. He hasn't got a modular sim. Uh, no, not, he might not do. Anyway, thank you very much, Robbie, for joining us. Uh, really much appreciate it. I hope we can have you again on uh, soon. Um, um, I know you're off on tour, but uh, that's just the way it goes. Yeah. Whenever you can. So, thank you, Robbie. Yeah. Always a pleasure. So, uh, Rich Hilton, thank you for joining us as well and uh, sharing your thoughts on our variety of topics. I know in the summer things tend to get a little slow, but not for you. You're busy, 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 busy. So uh, I hope you have uh, a little time to rest uh, be between your hectic schedule. Uh, thank you for joining us, mate. Thank you very much. I always enjoy it. <laughs> and Mark Tinley over there. Uh, in um, so a sunny part of the, the country, because it's certainly not sunny here. Anyway, <laughs> thank you for joining us. Summer of that. Summer of that. Oh, that's right. You are quite near here, aren't you? Yes, I sunny forgot about that. Of anyway, yeah. thanks for joining us, mate. And uh, we'll. Oh, you're very speak welcome. We'll speak again soon. Indeed. Uh, and Gaz Williams, uh, they're in Bristol. GazWilliams.me. You can find out more about Gaz. Uh, thank you very much. And. Uh, Stay tuned. We've got some more gas coming up uh, on uh, Sonic State, um, which we filmed quite recently. So look forward to that. Anyway, thank Brilliant. you very much. Pleasure. So that's it for this week. Uh, remember, if you wanted to try out, uh, my chair seems to be sinking. I think I must have lost some gas in my um, in my what's it, my, my valve. Uh, <laughs> Yes. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I also want to say thanks again to Chris for uh, the donation to the modular. Uh, also, thank you to Isotope uh, for. Um, sponsoring the show and do check out failedmuso.com where there's a book of condolences uh, if you want to contribute something to the the sort of outpouring of feelings towards uh, Steve Howell's passing so thank you very much that was Sonic Talk number 362